Greetings, hello. Welcome to my Saturday live stream programming where uh, for right now, as long as the History Channel's Project Blue Book series is going, I thought, hey, let's do actual historical analysis of those events that are depicted in the Blue Book series. And what do you know? We'll find out that those episodes are potentially, I would say even actually more interesting than our best Hollywood script writers can bring to bear. And I'm not criticizing the series per se, but I'm just saying the history behind what goes on in the Project Blue Book series is amazing. This week, I wanna talk about the green fireball phenomenon. And this was depicted in episode six of the series, um, which by the way, I remembered uh, Tracy and I did watch that. And as far as drama goes, it was kind of neat. neat. There are some interesting things about it. Uh, but as far as history goes, there's a lot that really got missing. And what I would love to do is explain as uh, clearly as I can just why this phenomenon was so, so important to our history. Uh, I would actually say that the green fireball phenomenon, and this is something that happened in uh, New Mexico during 1948, 1949, 1950. It actually went into 51 and into the early 50s beyond is one of the most significant early events of our UFO history, and it's kind of forgotten. I think a lot of people don't really appreciate just how significant it was. Let me give you a setting of what we're talking about here. So we're in the late 1940s. World War II had only recently ended. The atomic bomb was invented in New Mexico. It was first tested at Los Alamos. That is the home to the atomic bomb, and this is significant because, um, and by the way, it's not that far from Roswell, New Mexico, where in 1947, as we all know, something very big happened. I do think something non-human came down there, but whatever it was, it was quite important. During the late 40s, you've got Cold War fears. And, you know, this whole UFO phenomenon was still all very new. And for what it seemed, even by the late 40s, it was very evident that these objects seem to have an interest in United States military installations already. We were getting very, very interesting military reports uh, relating to UFOs. Already it was becoming clear that these objects seem to be interested in our nukes in one form or another, whether it was by uh, actual nuclear weapons where they were being stored, such as by Roswell, um, or nuclear scientific facilities, whether at White Sands, or excuse me, Los Alamos, or testing areas, White Sands, Oak Ridge in Tennessee, Hanford site in the uh, state of Washington where they manufactured plutonium, and all of these areas where there were lots of sightings of UFOs. So if you're managing the classified world and you are very, very up on nuclear tech at that time, you would be very interested in just what these objects were doing over your most sensitive and powerful technological areas. Um, before the green fireballs officially began, there were some couple of very interesting sightings. I think I've talked about these before here, but I'll just briefly mention the White Sands, New Mexico sightings of April, 1948. White Sands is in the south part of New Mexico uh, near Holloman Air Force Base. Uh, down that way, you've got um, on April 5th and then on April uh, 27th and 28th, no, 20, April 24th, excuse me. You had a team of Navy missile trackers who were, uh, and scientists, and they're tracking uh, launching of balloons. And while they're doing that, they've got uh, equipment that is designed for tracking these things, and they're called theodolites. So I'm gonna show you a picture of them later. But while just before they uh, launch the balloon, they see other things in the sky on April 5th and then again on the 24th. And we don't have a lot of information on the one from April 5th, but the one on April 24th was tracked by the measuring equipment to be going as fast as 18,000 miles per hour just off the charts. This got a lot of attention. Uh, one of the people involved was Dr. Lincoln La Paz. You'll be hearing a lot about him uh, during this chat. There was another individual named Dr. Joseph Kaplan. These were, um, Kaplan was a high level person in the Air Force Scientific Advisory Panel. 
they're having meetings about this almost immediately afterward, uh, late April, finding out what is going on here and do we need to take any scientific measures in terms of finding out uh, what, what it is. La Paz already is thinking that these objects that we're seeing are not natural they, and they are very, very important and we need to investigate them scientifically. Um, it was also said, incidentally, in one of the books uh, from the 1990s by Kevin Randall and Don Schmidt, The Truth About the UFO Crash at Roswell, that one of the men who went out to the Roswell debris field, Lewis Rickett, he actually was um, there with uh, Sheridan Cavett and Jesse Marcel. Uh, it's not clear that Rickett went to the debris field, but he was with the team. Anyway, Rickett apparently met with Lincoln La Paz in, um, around this time, and La Paz, according to Rickett anyway, was convinced that there were extraterrestrial probes uh, landing in New Mexico, and, and apparently that Roswell itself may have been one. However that is, the real situation is terms of, in terms of the green fireball starts in December 1948, on December 5th, you've got an Air Force uh, pilot. They're flying a, a C-47, a transport plane. They're at a normal altitude, about 18,000 feet. They're near Albuquerque. And the pilot sees what looks like to be a huge green, well, fireball, uh, arching upward. Now, that's a little odd. And then he sees it goes up, and then it levels off to a kind of a horizontal trajectory. Very shortly after this, another commercial airline pilot sees a, a fairly large uh, orangish, reddish object that then changes to the color of green, and it's approaching uh, totally horizontally, and it, it's coming toward his aircraft, and it dodges to the left um, and then away and toward the ground. And that's the beginning of these sightings, and they became known as the green fireballs. And this really got a lot of attention from the higher ups in the United States uh, Air Force and other branches of the military. FBI followed it. Edward Ruppelt of uh, Project Blue Book a few years later wrote about this and he just said, look, everyone, including all the intelligence officers at places like Kirtland Air Force Base, Air Defense Command people, Dr. Lincoln La Paz, who was again, one of the top media experts in the world, and uh, a lot of other high-level scientists within the Air Force at Los Alamos as well. All of them were involved in, in, in trying to understand this. Many of them had seen these fireballs. In fact, most of them. And no one could figure this out. It's a really interesting situation. So starting in December 1948 through um, really all of 1949, there were many, many reports. New Mexico had something like 75 reports of these green fireballs. And I learned that fact from the very excellent book by Dr. Bruce Maccabee called The uh, CIA FBI UFO Connection. I'll show you a cover of that later because I want to talk about Bruce's book. Um, but anyway, he had the number of 75 for the year. Now, this was a very important thing. And I would just point out that it was all pretty much unknown to the public at the time. Donald Kehoe wrote about it in uh, the early 50s, I think 1953, in one of his books. And that's when we mostly learned about it, or we began to. I'm going to show you a picture of Lincoln La Paz here. There he is. And uh, you can see he's a very sharp looking guy. He was certainly one of the top media experts in the world. And he was really the man in charge. He was the point man for organizing a scientific investigation of this. And as I'll explain to you, La Paz absolutely came to the conclusion that these objects were not natural. They were not meteors. They were not anything that he could identify. Uh, he was later stretching and thinking maybe they were Soviet missiles, but probably not. Maybe they're, I think his fundamental conclusion is that they were US test missiles. This is a painting of the green fireballs. And in fact, it was done by the wife of Lincoln La Paz. And I don't remember her first name offhand, but she obviously was a talented artist. And I don't know that this was exactly how all of them looked, 
but this was how she depicted the uh, very dramatic sighting of these fireballs. So there you get to see it. Whoops. Uh, I almost stopped broadcasting. I didn't want to do that. I just wanted to stop sharing the screen. <laughs> so um, anyway, La Paz himself saw these as well, just like everyone else. And when he saw it, it was in uh, the middle of December of 1948. He uh, was able to track the path of this object. And again, his decision was that this was unlike any meteor. First of all, he noticed that it had flown directly over Los Alamos, which was very interesting. And even more unusual than that, though, is that the object was completely horizontal. And it was, it was horizontal at a very low altitude, at least for a meteorite, um, of roughly eight miles, perhaps as high as 10 miles high. Now, that's pretty high for a commercial airliner back in those days, but it would be very, very low for a meteor. And in fact, it moved way too slowly to, meet it, to be a meteor. I don't have the speed, but in his estimation, this was not a meteor. He writes a confidential memo on December 20th, 1948, and he just says, this was not a meteor. This was not a fireball. Um, if it was, it was no type that I've ever studied, he says. And, uh, and again, a couple of years later, he tells Ruppelt that he didn't even believe these were a natural phenomenon at all. So you're talking about something that's, let's say, 10 miles up. That's a little over 50,000 feet. It would have been possible, I, I would imagine, to have something in the air there. But um, what, what natural, what artificial object would it have been? So the same day that La Paz writes this classified or this memo thinking, you know, these are not meteors, there's a Los Alamos group. He's part of it. They start an informal group of very high level scientists, engineers, security experts, and all of them uh, call themselves the Los Alamos Astrophysical Association. And they start uh, to really look into this. And they get permission, by the way, to examine a number of the classified reports on these fireballs that were collected by Project Sign. And all of these people apparently agreed with La Paz. These objects were not meteors. Now, the problem is if they're not meteors, then <laughs> what, on, what on earth or what off of earth could they be? So you see all throughout this period that they're straining for conventional explanations. And uh, some of La Paz's colleagues are wondering, are these missiles? being fired into Earth's atmosphere. But if that's so, are these Russian? And no one actually ever seems to have believed this. It, it didn't seem that this could be possible, frankly. And indeed, in the technology of the late 1940s, it really wasn't possible. And there was really no explanation or no candidate as to who could be doing it. So you've got that. There's no satisfactory answer to this whatsoever. As you move into 1949, this is when things really heat up. Um, there was a classified memo on January 13th of that year sent to the Director of Army Intelligence at the Pentagon, and it just says, agencies in New Mexico are greatly concerned over the phenomenon. They're talking about the green fireballs. And again, you get the same speculations. Maybe the Russians are up to something. Didn't really think so. The author of one this particular memo thinks it was more likely that the United States would be carrying on with some top secret experiments, um, that this would be very important and doing them over very sensitive installations. But again, the implication is why and who's doing it. And there's never been an explanation or an answer to this. On January 30th of 1949, there was a very big sighting. Hundreds of residents in New, New Mexico see a spectacular green fireball. Uh, an investigation was ordered by Kirtland Air Force Base. La Paz kind of roughly triangulates the object, and he comes up with an estimate of its speed between something like 25,000 miles an hour, 50,000 miles per hour. So the problem with that, in his opinion, is that there should have been what he called an ear-shattering sonic boom, but this object was totally silent. And La Paz that week tells the Air Force, there's an um, um, intelligence group, the Office of Special Investigation, OSI, 
He tells an OSI officer, Agent Paul Ryan, he says, these objects were surely artificial. Now, if they're surely artificial and they're going at upwards of 25,000 miles per hour, we've got a problem here. The very next day after this sighting, on January 31st, the FBI uh, puts out a memo. It's actually very well known to UFO uh, researchers, and I'll, I'll show you in just a second, but it talks about the protection of vital installations. Here, let me show it to you right here. And um, it's interesting because of a number of reasons. One is that it's, let me, here we go, share, boom, getting to be a real pro with this. Uh, the top part, I've got this split into two, and you can screenshot this and read it later. It's a very well-known memo. But the um, top part just talks about how uh, the Army's intelligence, SG2, the Office of Naval Intelligence, all these other groups, consider the matter of flying saucers to be uh, top secret. So that's interesting. Why would they be considered top secret? Well, that's a very interesting question. Um, the second part that I have on the bottom half simply talks about uh, the green fireballs and how they've been seen just very lately, how they uh, are inexplicable, and um, and so forth. So I just think that's a very interesting little memo there. Let me um, come back to where I was. So, so this is going on all through... January all through February, October. As I said, the state of New Mexico had a lot of these sightings throughout the month. As it gets toward the summer and late summer and into fall, a lot of these folks are making a decision and the uh, Air Force decides they're going to give this to one of their divisions and they're going to set up instrumentation, uh, hopefully to capture this on their, their synotheodolites. Before that happens, we're in October of 1949, there was another meeting. This included Edward Teller, uh, the uh, one of the key members of the Hydrogen Bomb Project. In fact, he was the one parodied in the movie Dr. Strangelove by Peter Seller. Uh, pretty funny. Anyway, Teller was at this meeting. This is October 14, 1949. And they're talking about this fireball phenomenon. And uh, this is in the words of uh, an Air Force Intelligence confidential memo. The continued occurrence of unexplained phenomena of this nature in the vicinity of sensitive installations is cause for concern. So th the debate wasn't whether the phenomenon was real. The debate was completely over whether it was natural or artificial. And it did seem like the good betting money was that it was artificial. La Paz never believed it was natural. And when you go through the bits of information that exist, there doesn't seem to be any argument from anyone who believed that these were natural. So, um, because obviously one of the questions was if the fireballs were a natural phenomenon, then why would they all be localized in New Mexico? Why, and, and why so recently for that matter? Why hanging out over places like Los Alamos with regularity? So what begins as a result of this is something known as Project Twinkle. And this is a, a project that really has been historically misunderstood. And I think the reason is that for many, many years, it was utterly misrepresented by uh, a lot of folks. Edward Ruppelt in his book, uh, Report on Unidentified Flying Objects, very much misrepresented Twinkle. He said it was a total failure. It wasn't a failure, and not in terms of the data that it got. Um, but it is true, it, I think Mac, Bruce McAbee def, definitely thinks that it was set up for failure. But essentially what happens is you get in early 1950, La Paz uh, makes his statement incidentally. It's like he gets cold feet for the whole thing. And he says, you know, we should just discontinue studying this whole green fireball phenomenon. And the reason is because I don't think they're green fireballs, he's saying. They have gotta be US guided missiles that are being tested near sensitive installations. He said, now, if I'm wrong, then we definitely need to begin an intensive systematic investigation of these objects. But the fact was, La Paz didn't run Project Twinkle. Um, two other people did, and I'll get into them in just a minute. The project begins on February 21st. 
And the plan was to triangulate and to photograph the one of these fireballs, at least one of them through. They were going to set up three of these Cine Theodolite stations. I'm going to show you a picture of, of them right here. They're uh, really neat. If I can get my computer to um, behave here. So this is it right here. You've got a bunch of... Um, Gentlemen, this is a, a photograph from the late 40s, I think 1948, 49. So around the time period of Twinkle, these are the types of instruments that they were using or that they were planning to use. And you can see they're quite sophisticated. These are designed to capture the uh, azimuth, that is the angle of, um, of an object, their altitude, speed, so if you're testing um, balloons or missiles, fast-moving objects, they were great at doing that. These were uh, very uh, effective types of instruments, and they're still used to this day. They're a lot more, uh, I think, uh, computerized and sophisticated today. But this is what we're talking about. So there we go. Back we are. Oh, and I want to show you a map as well. This is important for us to, um, for you to get an idea of where the activity of this was. So I just set this up on Google Earth. And if you can look pretty carefully here, so I've got four uh, areas that are pinned on Google Earth. So at the top, this is all New Mexico. You've got Los Alamos where in 1949, there were 26 sightings of the fireballs. Very, uh, a bit south of that is Sandia, National Labs, where there were 17. Over to the east is a little town of Vaughan. There were zero sightings there. Remember that fact. And then down south toward White Sands, you're at Hallam and Alamogordo area, and there were another 12 sightings for the year in 1949. So with that in mind, um, I'm going to show you, or I'm going to describe how they set up these stations here. And I've got my, um, here we go. Let me set this up for you. One of these days, I'm going to have a much better system in place. This is, we're still in uh, amateur town here. So I'll go back. Should I go back? Here we go. I can't go back. So uh, you see there's two red arrows. They never set up a third. They only set up two. So they set up one station down by Holloman where there had been 12 sightings, okay? And they set up the other one in Vaughn where there had been zero sightings. And again, there was not a third one that was set up. So then you have to ask yourself, what is going on? Why were these guys doing this in such a slipshod, um, clearly... Uh, a manner that was not designed to succeed, it seems to me. And indeed. So, according to Ruppelt, the whole thing just died without success. What, what definitely appeared to happen is that sightings radically dropped off during 1950. So they were very strong at the end of 48. They were very strong throughout 1949. And in the very the first few months of 1950, they actually were uh, pretty intense. And then when Twinkle began, according to the data they had, sightings dropped off considerably. They didn't stop, but they dropped off. And by November of 1951, the man who was running Project Twinkle was named Dr. Lewis Elterman. He worked at, uh, he was very impressive, uh, he had a very impressive career. He worked at the atmospheric physics laboratory of the geophysical research division of the air force cambridge research laboratory and it was the cambridge research laboratory that had the contract from the air force to do twinkle so elterman writes the final report in november of 1951 and he just says look the whole thing was a failure he said no information was gained he says really just dis discontinued the whole thing this is like an early version of the condon committee, in my opinion. Uh, he says, discontinue Twinkle. There's nothing that's going to be gained out of this. And that's what they did. Um, he mentioned Vaughn, New Mexico, and he justified putting 
one of the Asina Theodolo, Theodolo, Theodolite stations there because he said there had been an abnormal number of reports from Vaughn. Really, there was zero in 1949 and there was one in early 1950, one. And so he puts one there. Meanwhile, there had been all this activity going on elsewhere. Again, they did put one out in Holloman, Holloman by White Sands, but I've got a, a picture of the, um, of the Twinkle report. I'll just show you this again here. Again, the day will come and we have this a little bit, a little bit better. So that's the cover sheet of the Twinkle report. And I believe I've got um, one more page here of the, I, there we go. And that's where Elterman says no results, um, no results were obtained. So there you go. And, but in fact, that's not the case. Results were obtained. And this is a cover of Bruce Maccabee's book. I want to show you this. This is the FBI CIA UFO connection. I published this book, I think back in 2014. Bruce did a really fabulous job on this book. Um, I think no one has done a better job at capturing the relationship of the FBI and the CIA, and for that matter, the US Air Force, to the UFO phenomenon during the late 1940s, early 1950s. And I just, I really wanted to give a shout out to this book and to Bruce, he deserves it. He did a really fine work on this. And in fact, it's a very well-written book. It's, again, I think the best book on that subject that you're gonna find anywhere. So in any case, what Bruce does in this book is something no one else does. He comes up with an outstanding analysis of Project Twinkle and he proves that Twinkle was really a sham of an, of an operation, uh, almost designed to fail. So I mentioned Dr. Lewis Elterman. Prior to Elterman, the head of Twinkle was a man named Dr. Anthony Merarchi. Merarchi began as director of Twinkle, but he retired in October of 1950. So he was not involved with Twinkle when Elterman wrote the final report a year later. So here's the thing, Merarchi, you know, he seemed like a, a normal skeptical scientist, but he wasn't someone who would be involved in just hiding data. It's not clear if Merarchi even ever saw the final Twinkle report that Elterman wrote. But what we do know is that Merarchi took the sightings seriously. And at one point in May of 1950, before he retired, he visited Holloman Air Force Base where there had been some trackings of these fireballs. And he says, I want to report on the sightings. Apparently you recorded sightings on April 27th and on May 24th here at Holloman, please give them to me. So they give a report to Marachi and this report is was found in the National Archives microfilm in the late seventies. And this one document totally refutes Elterman's claims. And again, I wanna show you this. Um, this is actually, I just retyped it because it's a lot easier to see than um, if you were to look at the original document, which I do have and I will show you. But you can see, so the first part of this is, sightings were made on April 27th and May 24th, 1950 of aerial phenomena during morning daylight hours at this station. The sightings were made by Land Air Inc personnel while engaged in tracking regular projects with Ascania phototheodolites. It has been reported that objects are sighted in some number. As many as eight have been visible at one time. The individuals making these sightings are professional observers. Therefore, I would rate their reliability superior. In both cases, photos were taken with Ascania. So that was the equipment used. And this is really the key part right here. And again, this I just uh, included, retyped from the document. Objects observed, and he gives the dates. Um, from this info, oh, here we go. Uh, 
at the bottom of part number one, film taken from station P10 was read, resulting in azimuth and elevation angles being recorded on four objects. In addition, size of image on film was recorded. So you go down to 3A. The objects were at an altitude of approximately 150,000 feet. B, the objects were over the Holloman range between the base and Tularosa Peak. C, the objects were approximately 30 feet in diameter. D, the objects were traveling at an undeterminable yet high speed. And uh, signed by Wilbur L. Mitchell, mathematician of the data reduction unit. So that's a really important statement because what you have is, you know, Elterman and his report says no, uh, no results were obtained and this is absolutely not the case. And here in fact is the original of what I had retyped and you can screenshot that. And this I actually lifted right out of Bruce's book, the FBI CIA UFO connection. So, and I definitely recommend you read that book if you want to get a truly detailed analysis of Twinkle, of the green fireballs, and of everything else going on at that time. Again, Bruce really did a fabulous job of that. So there you have it. And uh, ask yourself, 150,000 feet. So we didn't have anything. We had no objects that could fly at 150,000 feet in 1950. All right. Uh, 30 feet in diameter, moving at a fast, very fast speed. We don't know what the speed was, but it was clearly something that perplexed them. So what were they? What were these objects? And by the way, uh, so Twinkle closed down by uh, the late part of 1951. Elterman releases his report. I think it's in November of 1951. At around that time, the fireballs were still being seen, even after Twinkle wound down. They made the news, and there was a news uh, paper. The Associated Press quoted Lincoln La Paz. There had been uh, seven sightings of green fireballs in the last 11 days. So it had really made a resurgence just as Twinkle has wound down. Um, and La Paz is talking about this. First of all, he says, there has never been a rate of meteorite fall in history that has been one fifth as high as the present fall, he says. If that rate should continue, I would suspect that the phenomenon is not natural. They don't behave like ordinary meteorites at all. That was Lincoln La Paz's quote. And I just want to point out, he says, if it should continue, I would suspect. Like, what are you talking about? This is an unbelievable meteorite fall rate and uh but he's he's obviously playing it very low key for the press and for the public uh, and by the way the very next day there was an eighth fireball in 13 days that was seen over albuquerque um in fact it was noticed as far away as wyoming so anyway despite the intensity of this so-called meteor barrage twinkle's final report came out in uh, december indicating that the whole program to capture these on film had failed. And you really have to wonder how, how was it that Twinkle failed to record even one of these from the recent barrage or from any of these barrages? And it turns out that the data was there, but it was buried. And it was, uh, we could really say, intentionally buried. I don't really think there's any other way to put it. Uh, I think this is Bruce's claim, his argument in uh, his book, I think it's always been my opinion that Twinkle was either designed to fail or, um, well, I don't think it was, there was incompetence. Why would you put a theodolite system in Vaughn where there had been no sightings? So I think that alone tells you. And the fact is that they wanted to have, the plan was to have three of them. They only ended up with two. Um, the fact is the data that they had with the instrumentation that they used was very strong. And when you're tracking objects moving at altitudes and speeds that these things appear to be moving at, and when there isn't a good naturalistic explanation, well then what are you left with? You're left with something that appears to be artificial, that appears to be localized, that appears to have intent, that got the 
the opinions of all of those scientists who were studying it at the time to believe that these were not natural, that these were artificial. And then the whole thing just goes away. So that's a microcosm really of the entire UFO phenomenon, in my opinion. And uh, such, a, such is the mystery of the green fireballs. So I will look forward to the day when we have a little bit of a smoother uh, technical situation going on here. But for right now, hopefully this was interesting for you. Uh, really all I wanted to do in this live stream was to put a couple of interesting images out so you could see them. And uh, hopefully that made the experience a little more rich, a little more interesting. But the bottom line is the information. And this phenomenon is of the fireball phenomenon was one that really captured a lot of attention, a lot of grave concern among high-level people in the intelligence community and in the scientific community. And with all of that concern, for such a bland report to be issued, you've got to assume that's a real discrepancy, there's a real problem. What is wrong with this picture? That's what's wrong with this picture. So the Blue Book series covered this in, uh, you know, more or less, they talked about the fireballs. I'm happy that they're generating interest in the phenomenon. Uh, of course, they had Alan Hynek go down himself, and he did his own triangulation of the fireballs in the episode. Uh, that's not what happened in reality, but it is true, uh, and the, the episode did portray the, the real perplexity that existed with the fireballs. A lot of the other drama, no. Uh, the, the German paperclip connection, it's not unreasonable to at least look into that as a possibility, but the fact is there is there's really nothing tying the German paperclip connection to uh, the green fireball phenomenon that I've ever learned about. So what we have is a genuine mystery and something that, you know, how many years later is it? 70 years later? Yes, 70 years later. And we still don't know what these things were. So fascinating stuff. This is why I study UFOs. Hope you enjoyed this. If you like the video, please feel free to like it. You can always subscribe to my YouTube channel. If you want to know what I'm up to on a weekly basis, I have a weekly newsletter. Thank goodness Tracy organizes that. She makes it look good. But there's a lot of information in there to subscribe to the newsletter. It's free. Go to either of my websites, Richard Dolan Members, Richard Dolan Press. They both got links to subscribe to the newsletter, and you'll get it in your mailbox. Kick it up old school with email. Remember those days of email? Newsletter goes to your email, and you can get it every week. We never miss a week. How about that? So that's it. Um, I'd like to thank you for hanging out, and I'll catch you next time.